Good morning and welcome to the What's On Board briefing for SpaceX's 15th commercial resupply services mission right here from um, America's multi-user spaceport, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Greg Harland with NASA's Office of Communication. Tomorrow morning we have a projected launch of the, um, of the SpaceX rocket at 5.42 a.m. from Launch Complex 40 on, Kennedy, or on uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, carrying over 5,900 pounds of equipment and supplies to the International Space Station. On board the Dragon spacecraft will be critical materials to directly support dozens of over 250, 250 science and research investigations that will occur on Expedition 56. Today we're going to hear from some of the people that have worked to make this mission a success. If you have any questions for us um, out there in TV land, please reach out via Twitter at hashtag AskNASA. And to begin our program, we're going to see a video from the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space, often referred to as CASIS. The National Lab um, is run by CASIS on the International Space Station. This launch represents the 15th resupply mission by SpaceX to the International Space Station. This mission is truly packed with an incredible amount of research that has the capacity to benefit life on Earth. Let's find out a little bit more about some of the payloads that are destined to the space station on this mission, sponsored by the U.S. National Laboratory. NGX is an innovative startup based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, looking to improve cancer patient care. NGX has created a novel cancer therapy targeting a protein in the proliferation of endothelial cells, which line the walls of blood vessels. This project seeks to evaluate if these cells, cultured in microgravity, represent a valid system to test the effects of vascular targeted cancer drugs on normal blood vessels. The University of Florida has a rich history in plant biology research. Now, a new University of Florida plant biology investigation seeks to develop electrochemical cells suitable for spaceflight to study instability under microgravity conditions. The investigation could ultimately develop algae that could help sustain both a low Earth orbit space economy and long duration deep space missions. The University of California, Santa Barbara, in association with the National Science Foundation, is sending a project focused on the study of forces between particles that cluster together. In microgravity, investigators can observe how particles cluster over long time scales without gravitational settling, which complicates measurements taken on Earth. This work has several important applications that will benefit life on Earth, including ecosystem modeling, deep water hydrocarbon exploration, sequestration, and mobilization of contaminants, among others. There are multiple student organizations supporting education investigations intended to stimulate and engage the next generation on this mission. One such group is the Student Spaceflight Experiments Program, in partnership with DreamUp and hardware developer Nanorax. This collection of students around the world will send over 30 separate student investigations on this mission. This is just a small portion of the incredible amount of research that is destined for the space station as part of this mission. To learn more about all the payloads on this mission, or to learn how to become part of the space station research community, visit iss-cases.org. From NASA's Johnson Space Center, please welcome David Brady, the Assistant Program Scientist for the International Space Station Program, and the Deputy Chief Scientist from CASES, Dr. Mike Roberts. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Hey, I'm happy to hear y'all, see y'all here today. It's wonderful to have a packed room, even though I'm sorry we couldn't give y'all all seats, but it's, it's really neat to see the interest here. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about perspective. Uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the details of the research investigations. I'm going to leave that to the investigators to talk about. But I was thinking about my flight out here from Houston to Orlando, some different things. First of all, how the human mind seeks to understand things, how we seek to um, create new things. And a lot of times we get that from a change of perspective or a change of environment. And that's one of the things that the lab aboard the International Space Station provides, is that we provide a unique environment, specifically microgravity, space radiation, and for external payloads, a vantage point and the external environment as well. So uh, some of the things I was thinking about coming out here with regards to the, uh, the folks we have here today is 
the first thing I was thinking is, you know, when I first started flying on an airliner, uh, telephones were things that hung off of walls and sat on tables, and an address book and a calendar was something you pulled out a pen and you wrote into, and a camera you stuck film in it, and you took it down to you know drugstore to get it get it uh, processed. But now we all have this little thing that you could rightfully call a mobile companion that we use in our everyday lives for all of these functions and even more. So I'm excited that today y'all are going to hear from some folks on the mobile companion investigation to talk about how we're going to take hardware and software and apply that to provide a mobile companion for our flight crews in order to make their lives safer, make their work more efficient, and hopefully in the future make their environment more pleasant as well. So, of course, I'm working on my cell phone on the airliner, and I'm up at 39,000 feet, and I'm sitting there, you know, munching on my pretzel. And, uh, you know, a pretzel is actually a, a really simple thing, but there's a lot of science and engineering in this little guy here. I mean, um, if you think about it, there's a biology, there's chemistry, and there's physics in this, because at some point, someone had to say, hey, I think I'm going to go grab that fruit off that plant in the field, and I'm going to haul it in, and I'm going to grind it up, and then I'm going to chemically mix it with some other substances, and then I'm going to apply heat to it, and I'm going to create something that's useful and tasty, you know, something that I like. And so fortunately, we've gotten smarter in nowadays. It doesn't take us years and years and years to develop an item, but one of the investigations you're going to see today, they're going to use the unique microgravity environment uh, on board the space station in order to study the physics of nanotubes. So Chemical Gardens will be coming to talk to you all about that a little bit later. So uh, again, I'm on the airliner, I'm up at 39,000 feet, I'm working on my cell phone, I'm eating my pretzels, and I'm looking out the window. Looking out the window is not something I've done my entire business life, because when I first started doing business travel, my inclination was, no, I want to sit on the aisle, and where the snack tray is, the trash can is, you know, the restrooms are, and all that. Uh, once my daughter started flying, though, she always wanted to sit by the window. And I said, why do you want to sit by the window? And she says, because of the awesome view. So that's one of the things we provide with Space Station, especially for our Earth science and our space science folks, is the awesome view of Earth. And you're going to hear from the EcoStress folks today about their uh, investigation they're doing, the research they're doing about water in plants. So finally, the other thing I like about flying between Houston and Orlando, as part of the awesome view, I'm eating my pretzels, I'm looking, working on my cell phone, I'm looking out the window, is when you fly right over the mouth of the Mississippi River. And if you've never done that, it's just amazing the amount of sediment, the amount of effluent that's coming out of the mouth of the river. And that is part of our ecological and geological processes, and understanding that is really important. But the problem is, is that on Earth, all those sediments in a lab tend to settle really fast because of gravity. So we're going to have some folks here today from BCAT CS to talk to you a little bit about how they're using the unique environment on board the space station in order to study those processes so that they understand them better and be able to apply them back here on Earth. So last thing I want to mention is a shout out to our robotics folks. Although they're technically not part of our research investigations, uh, the building of the space station, the operating of the space station would not be possible without the robotics technology. And I'm also very proud to say that that robotics technology has come home and has been adapted so that there are medical procedures that could not be done prior to this technology being developed and so it's making people's lives on Earth a lot better. So along those lines, I'm going to turn it over to Mike now to talk about the National Lab stuff. Thanks, Dave. It, it's difficult to pick up following pretzel logic, but I'll do my best here. <laughs> uh, first of all, welcome. Uh, you saw the opening video uh, with the lovely face of, of Patrick O'Neill talking about what CASIS is. Uh, and I wanted to highlight just a couple of other experiments that are going up on that and explain to you a little bit about the great excitement that I share with Dave in our partnership with NASA in managing the International Space Station National Lab. So as Dave mentioned, the International Space Station is many things to many different people. But from the viewpoint of investigators and technology developers, it offers opportunities, unique opportunities, that are one of a kind, off this world opportunities to test technology, to demonstrate the validity of technologies, and to do fundamental basic research that is of interest not only to NASA and the international partners who work in the space realm all the time, but to investigators who work here on Earth. So among those are experiments you'll hear more about later that are sponsored and funded by the National Science Foundation, that are flying projects that are exploring the fundamental physics of, of materials in the space environment using the BCATS apparatus developed by uh, implementation partners that have supported NASA for years. There are a multitude of student spaceflight experiments that Patrick touched on that are 
leveraging the imagination of youngsters and their excitement about not only thinking about space, but actually designing experiments and taking them from the drafting page all the way through to execution and then actually analyzing data from that spaceflight environment. And you also learn about some companies that are supporting commercial research activities. One of those is a commercial platform Muses. It's developed by Teledyne Brown Engineering and will have its first payload hosted from DLR today. So we are now seeing in the space environment this opportunity for sharing of space and for building new opportunities in that space environment by collaboration between federal funding agencies that are sponsoring research, commercial companies that are sponsoring R&D activities that are of interest to their portfolio, and the continued success of NASA in demonstrating the utility of having this orbiting laboratory operating in the harshness of space and microgravity all the time. And with that, I'd like to cue the video, uh, go into a little bit deeper about one of the commercial payloads that will be operating. We're trying to make a therapy that can address 90% of cancers uh, and make, make cancer a non-fatal disease. In the U.S., over one-third of people go on to develop cancer in their lifetime. My mother uh, died of cancer, and she died at age 33 when, when I was 10 years old. Wasn't able to do anything for her when she was alive, but I can at least have made my contribution to all the future mothers uh, who might be in a similar situation. Microgravity is providing a very good model for us to study how drugs are targeting normal blood vessels and to test our cancer therapy in this model. Our approach destroys both the tumor cells and the tumor blood vessels simultaneously and the whole tumor dies for lack of oxygen and nutrients. We notice astronauts have more cardiovascular disease but less cancer and we notice endothelial cells, which are the type of cells that make up blood vessels, didn't grow in space. So we're sending up a bunch of endothelial cells. We're going to treat them with our drug. And we want to see if endothelial cells in space are different than on the ground. NGX's mission is to cure cancer, and microgravity may provide that opportunity. I just wanted to, to conclude, NGX came to us through the Mass Challenge Program. Uh, so in partnership with Boeing, CASIS and Boeing are able to offer opportunities for small entrepreneurial startups who have new ideas, innovative new ways to develop therapies such as for cancer, to develop new medical devices and other advances in technology that can directly utilize the International Space Station National Lab. So. We're excited for the launch tomorrow morning. Uh, everybody, I hope, is anxious to get up at 3 in the morning to get their spot and get started. Great. So uh, great overview, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions for Mike or David? Please. You got to wait for a microphone to come by here real quick. Uh, Jim Siegel. I'm with Space Flight Insider. I'm interested in roughly how many discrete uh, experiments or investigations are on board this uh, this flight, uh, both from the cases point of view and from you know, the, the total manifest point of view. I, I have to get back to you with a total number because I focus mainly on the new ones, but I know there's 27 new ones going up, and I believe as mentioned before that those contribute to a total of over 300 that will be operating during expeditions 55 and 56. And uh, the 27 are, are both CASIS and... and on yeah, so for on the ISS correct. National Lab side, there's 20 payloads that uh, represent over 50 experiments that are going on. Thank you. Okay, does anybody else have a question back here? Just one moment for the microphone to get to you, please. Can, can you talk about um, a couple of the student projects that are going up and what those are like? Um, so we're very excited about all the student projects that are going up, so I don't want to pick on any one of them in particular. <laughs> um, but there are a few that are looking actually at kidney cells in the microgravity environment. So you heard from Angie X and others that 
there's a lot of interest in removing gravity from the growth of cells. That has advantages and disadvantages. At a fundamental level, uh, some students are looking at simply ways to culture cells in that environment and monitoring their oxygen uptake and ability to, to metabolize in that environment. So we have a variety of experiments on this missions and others before those that have focused either on human cells in culture which is something that I wasn't able to do when I was in high school, or plant cell culture. Uh, we've had quite a few experiments that have focused on growth of algae and microalgae in that environment as well. And the, the cost of admission for students to those is, is drastically down now through partnerships with DreamUp, NanoRack, Space Tango. There are a lot of companies now that are directly engaged with high schools to work with students and student mentors to develop projects and the, the price point for them getting in is now to the point where high school students working out of their basement can almost uh, fund their own their own small lab to go up it's an exciting time anybody else have a question for mike or david yes back here please wait for the microphone in terms of the projects that go up is there a combination between things that the space station wants to have happen and um, private industry wanting to, or do you have specific numbers of um, we have room for outside experiments and then specific things that you want to have happen? Yeah, the way the uh, research is divided with regards to sponsorship is that uh, among the American research, it's split 50-50 between the National Lab and NASA. And then in addition to that, we also have our international partners as well that participate. And there are folks that are looking to add new capabilities all the time. So. We want to continue to exceed the capacity of the International Space Station and see it grow. And there are already companies that are coming up with innovative new ways to get even more science and technology there, more innovative ways to return samples back to Earth quickly, and ways to communicate data back between Earth and, and uh, the International Space Station in a more rapid manner. So right now is, is the time to see that grow. Great. We have time for just one more question right up here in the front row. We hear a lot about the, uh, the space station uh, program being wound down or, or defunded or, or shut down. Is, is there anything you could tell us about that and maybe what the next phase might be or future plans? You start. Uh, the, the presidential budget that was offered up indicated that uh, they would like to reduce, uh, it was proposed that we reduce the government portion of the support of space station in 2025 to zero. Um, there's a lot of folks looking at that right now to see exactly what that means because obviously you don't go from a budget of, of this much to zero. Uh, but as part of implementing the, the overall plan to, uh, to work with commercial companies, that's always been part of our, our charter. Yeah, and, and from our perspective at the Center for Advancement of Science and Space, we've seen growing and sustained interest from many different sectors of the commercial economy, from material science developers through pharmaceutical companies who've made extensive use of the platform. We're seeing increased engagement and funding opportunities provided by government agencies other than NASA, so National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, Department of Defense are all funding research utilizing the International Space Station National Laboratory. So although the funding structure is going to change at some point in the future, we're very confident that as a platform, the International Space Station is going to continue to operate for as long as people see utility in it and we're able to get science and technology development up there and back. And the future is very bright for that. OK, well, thank you, David and Mike, for sharing with us that, uh, that perspective, for sure. So thank you so much. So you go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so next, to discuss the Crew Interactive Mobile Companion, or Simon Project, is Dr. Christian Keresh program lead for, uh, from the German Aerospace Center, and Philip Schulian, project engineer from Airbus. Yeah, Simon says, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the honor of being here to present our project. So Simon was developed by Airbus, and the artificial intelligence comes from IBM, and we, I'm from DLR, we are yeah, the payload owner. So what is Simon? Simon is uh, a free-floating artificial intelligence 
His journey will begin tomorrow. And when he will be activated, this is kind of a historical moment. So this will be the first operating artificial intelligence with a human-machine interaction. So maybe you can also start the video in the back so you get some impressions what happened so far. So we trained Simon. He's uh, especially trained to the German astronaut. So these are some pictures from the parabolic flight. So we tested him already in weightlessness. And this technology demonstration together with Airbus and IBM um, is a kind of uh, yeah, pioneer challenge. So to implement an artificial intelligence in real time into the International Space Station, that's a really tough challenge in terms of uh, safety and security. Here you can see Alexander Gerst. He trained with him, his face recognition and his voice and things like this. So we are very happy that Simon <laughs> will be the first artificial intelligence in space. Um, one of the main challenges, so we are a team of about 50 people working on this for the last two years. And usually in space you need uh, yeah, five or ten years for a project like this with this complexity. But we managed and uh, made this challenge happen. So we are very, very happy. And maybe my colleague can say some few words to the technical. Just one point I want to figure out is um, that for us, this is a piece of the future of human spaceflight. I mean, if you go out to the moon or to Mars, so you cannot take all mankind and engineers with you, so the astronauts, they will be on their own. So, but with an artificial intelligence, you have instantly all the knowledge of mankind. And this is just the first technology demonstration for us, but I guess it's one step into the future for exploration. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to give you a short insight into what's actually happen happening on board of the International Space Station once Simon is up there. So what, what will happen basically is that Simon will be floating somewhere inside the Columbus module and Alexander Gerst, which Simon is tailored to, Simon the free flyer, will call Simon at a certain time. Then Simon, with the help of a microphone array, will acoustically, acoustically know where Alexander Gerst is speaking from. Simon will orient towards Alexander Gerst and then the orientation will switch towards the front camera. With front camera, we perform face detection, so we detect all the faces that are inside the camera, inside the picture of the camera. Afterwards, we perform face recognition with the help of our IBM APIs, where we got great support from IBM. Then Alexander Gerst could say something like, Simon, could you please help me performing a certain, certain experiment? Could you please help me with the, with the procedure? Then Simon will fly towards Alexander Gerst with the help of 14 impellers that are inside this sphere. So we have four tubes for quite fast acceleration to the, to the front. And then Simon will fly towards Alexander Gerst and they will already start the communication. So Simon will then guide Alexander Gerst through a procedure. He will show on the screen on the front. He will show, for example, videos or, or displays or pictures of the, of the facility. And then if Alexander Gerst has certain questions to that experiment he's working on, Simon has quite deep knowledge on that experiment. So he can really get inside the experiment and he can ask questions that are beyond the procedure. And also, for example, Alexander Gerst can, can then sign verbally certain steps from the procedure. He can go one, one step ahead, one step back, or he can, he can do whatever he wants, basically, with this one. Um, what else do we got here? We got a microphone on the very, on the back. Then we got an infrared camera on the front, for example. The whole hardware is electrically powered, so we got two batteries in the back, but it can also be powered hardwired. Then we got, which, is, which was quite important for Alexander Gerst, who we did several training sessions with, was that we had an actual an offline button. If that button is activated, that's on the back. Thank you, Christian. Once that button is activated, Alexander Gerst can be sure that nothing that he's actually saying by now is streamed down to Earth. So it's kind of private then. And once it's okay for him that the information is sent back to Earth again, he just deactivates the offline button and then it will be streamed down to the, to the IBM server again. And Simon will be able to, to talk again to the crew. Maybe one thing I want to add, um, the batteries we are very happy 
that uh, the SRB team supported or helped us so we couldn't qualify batteries uh, within our own project but we take batteries which they qualify for the International Space Station so without them and without them support so we this would be our showstopper the batteries so we are very happy so this is a kind of yeah space spirit we're doing here with NASA and all the other uh, yeah, nice collaboration technology. Sure. it's a really great collaboration and it really works so people are very friendly helpful and yeah that's we great thank for that so because it was a very fast time project running less than two years we just didn't have the time for the battery certification so we were very, th very thankful to get the batteries from the SRV team which is okay. just just that's great, great operation and what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce you to the IBM vice president for the AI portion of this project, Brett Greenstein. So we're going to take some questions. I got a front row question right here, please. Uh, Chris Gebart with NASA Spaceflight. Can you talk about how um, Simon connects to the cloud on the International Space Station? Does it have to, does its operation have to be timed like for certain? Um, periods with connection through the network and um, since you had to imprint it to Alexander for this flight what happens to Simon when Alexander comes back to earth at the end of the year okay so um, you can probably talk better to the technical communications of the satellite to the earth um, but during the times when there is connectivity um, all the communications go back through the cloud so all the AI work is being processed at the cloud natural language all the training and, and tailoring we did happens in the cloud which also means we can enhance it from the Earth anytime and make it smarter constantly um, to help um, Alexander and the team to use it. Um, it is tailored and tuned and trained to work with Alexander, but it's, a, it's an open system. It works with everybody who listens. It was just specifically trained uh, to help on some of the terminology and the way that he speaks to make it work even better for him. So it works for everybody. Great. I think, Ken, you had a question? Just one moment for the microphone, please. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Um, thanks for doing this session. Um, how, how difficult would it be for um, someone besides Gers to work with it since it's specifically for him? And is it multilingual? So it would work with anybody. Uh, it, obviously, it's tuned to language. So this is designed to work in English, works in English. It understands Alexander. In particular, it was helpful to train it to recognize him so that it will come to him when he speaks. So that part is helpful, but it'll work for all the astronauts now. Um, and on language support, um, right now it's English, but um, our Watson services support many languages. So I can give you a few more information. What, what does actually mean tailored to Alexander Guest? We had several familiarization sessions together with Alexander Guest, so he was able to choose, for example, the face that is displayed on the screen <laughs> once he's talking. He had, the, he had been able to choose between a quite a simple smiley, quite a close face to the human face, and he made his choice something quite in between. For example, he was also able to choose the, the voice that that the IBM, that the, that the language that actually comes out of Simon, if it should be male or female, for example, or which, which accent it should have. And then he was also able to, to influence the design slightly and to give his commands or to, to, to send us his, his commands in advance. And we were able to train really the, the words that Alexander Guest tends to use quite, quite often and all the abbreviation, for example, that Alexander Guest uses. So it will work with everyone. It can also work with, with everyone in this room. Everyone is able to speak with it, but Alexander Guest is able to speak with it best. That's great. I think we have a, a social question, don't we? Um, Lee would like to know, how does Simon move in zero gravity? So we got 14 impellers inside this sphere. There are seven, no, sorry, there are eight impellers in this direction, so it is able to move quite fast to the front. Then we got four impellers in, in this direction, so it's able to move quite well to the left and to the right, and we got two impellers into the up direction, so it's able to stabilize and also to, do, to perform short movements. We don't have any gyroscopes or anything in there, it's just moving with the, with the help of impellers. So we suck in air on the back, for example, and then we push it out to the front, and then we're flying backwards. Great question. Marsha? Um, Marsha Dunn, Associated Press, I have a couple questions. Um, would Simon be able, if there was a breakdown on the space station, could you, could uh, an astronaut help fix uh, the broken toilet, or, or, or if there was someone sick, could there be some diagnoses, medical things? Are there any implementations like that? Uh, for the time being, this is just a technology demonstration. So we have just three hours of crew time, 
So with commissioning, then we do a, we'll do an educational experiment, and we do we'll do some skill training, and he's not trained to all yeah emergencies and all protocols for the space station. So this is just the first step. So maybe for a future operating system, but this is going to take a while. And we have time for just one more question. I'll go back here. This gentleman right here. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Fields, on my copy break. Um, I assume when an astronaut is communicating with Simon, he uses a wake word like Simon. Once he starts that, does he use that wake word each time, or is it more conversational like Google Play? There is a certain mode that we have installed. Um, if it's activated, the crew needs to say every time Simon. So in case, for example, if a second crewmate enters the Columbus module, Simon shall not be supposed to, to listen to that con conversation all the time and, and shall not disrupt that conversation. That's why we implemented that feature. So if you switch that mode on, it will only react if you start a sentence with Simon, what's going on? Simon, how are you? Simon, can you please help me? If you switch off this mode, then you can just talk freely to Simon and it will listen to everything that you're saying and you don't need any keywords, you can just speak to it freely as, we, as whatever you like to say. And we've, and we've done a lot of work to make sure we pick up on sort of the way conversational cues work so you know when something's directed at Simon or something else. And there's a lot of work to be done around conversational analytics to make it as natural as possible since multiple people are talking in an environment. And just what? <laughs> of course. The astronaut. <laughs> Maybe just one thing I want to add. I mean, it's a bit more as a smartphone which follows you. So for, for this approach we're doing, it's what is really, really important for us is the human-machine interaction so that uh, the astronaut works together with an artificial intelligence as a team. So human and machine, they are both part of our experiment. And we are, well, we are very curious what, what Alexander Guest will <coughs> tell us after trying Simon. Well, that is some great technology for sure. Christian, Philip, Brett, thank you so much for joining us this morning and sharing a little bit about Simon with us. So thank you very much. Chemical gardens are structures that grow during the interaction of metal salt solutions with a select anions. Joining us today to share details about the chemical gardens science study are principal investigators Dr. Richard Grugel from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center and Dr. Oliver Steinbach from Florida State University. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are, we're having something completely different from you for you guys. Could I have the first slide, please? Uh, so we are studying chemical gardens uh, oh, can I have the first slide? Okay, awesome. So we are studying chemical gardens and they are inorganic precipitation structures that are looking extremely lifelike. And uh, they're about a centimeter, a couple of centimeters, an inch high, formed within you know, a few minutes. And yes, as you can see, have this tendency to grow upwards. And this will be, of course, important. Next slide, please. So probably the older ones in the audience remember that maybe the younger ones too. These were little chemical toy demonstrations, right? And so it has a very long history. It's actually older the history than this box. Even Isaac Newton already studied these systems in his al alchemical studies. Uh, next slide. And uh, here's another picture of them grown in the laboratory at Florida State University. And you see that there are these different colors. So I want to quickly tell you what these structures are made of and how they are produced. You have a clear liquid, it's a basic solution of silicate, and you drop a little tiny crystal in there, and within seconds this crystal starts to dissolve, reactions occur, and a little membrane forms around the crystal, and then water flows in, the membrane bursts, and out of it comes a kind of buoyant jet of salt solution, and around that jet you get these chemical gardens that grow. So they're actually hollow tubes, uh, the water is maybe 10 microns thick, in, in these experiments, and the different colors are different materials. Uh, silicates, copper oxides, copper hydroxides, compounds like that, some of which have catalytic activity. Okay, next slide. And uh, so that brings me to the reason why would we study them, okay? So there are actually at least three good reasons why you want to study these systems and the microgravity follows from it. 
So this was actually a movie playing there, showing the growth. Um, the, uh, there are natural structures that are very, very similar. So on the left, you see hydrothermal vents, these white and black smokers on the ocean floor. And those, from a chemical point of view, those materials are very, very similar. And uh, uh, on the right-hand side, you have another natural phenomena. They are brinicles. They're actually happening uh, under ice floating on the ocean. And these gigantic ice tubes extend down to the ocean floor. So they are also tubular structures in very different length scales. More interesting for me are the ones on the left, these uh, hydrothermal vents. Uh, they are a possible place where life might have started on Earth. And I very quickly give you three good reasons why it might have happened there. These materials uh, have free energy available to them. It's hot and uh, you know different pHs on different sides. So there's an energy source that life could have tapped into. The materials are microporous, so they're tiny little pores where material can accumulate, and you don't have to produce a lipid cell membrane. The wall structure is catalytically active, so you initially don't need uh, enzymes. And there are some simple interesting compounds coming out of the ground when these things are operational. So of interest for NASA is also that similar structures might exist on other moons. Um, and uh, so we essentially produce these in tiny versions in the laboratory to study them. Next slide, please. That's my last. Uh, another motivation is to turn this into a new type of engineering. Uh, it looks like a little toy, but every good technology starts maybe as a toy when you look at the first transistor or so. And, uh, uh, so the idea is here to essentially grow tubular structures in a more organic life-like way. So the way I want to explain that is if life, if biology wants to grow a finger, it doesn't produce finger material, extrusion molds, that, uh, it grows it in a programmed organical kind of way. So I, we believe that this is something that you also can do with inorganic materials reactions and to turn this into a t different type of technology. So I hand it over to Richard. Okay, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, we're really pleased to be here. Um, that slide you just saw, um, just to start out, that is not the planet eater from the original Star Trek series. Uh, it is a microfluidic tube that um, a flow rate does go through. And um, that flow rate is dependent on two terms, a buoyancy term and a pressure term. Um, we know that those work and we can determine the uh, flow rates from that, but we don't know the relative contributions from those two terms. In microgravity, the buoyancy term has a gravity factor in it, and up there it's going to basically go to zero. And uh, when that happens, we'll have nothing but the pressure term to, do, to uh, make the structure. And then when we bring them back down, we'll be able to uh, evaluate those. And um, we can uh, determine um, strictly from that how these things are growing, and we'll be able to sort out those two terms. So the next slide, please. Okay, um, so as, as Professor Steinbach mentioned, we can probably try to make some novel structures, including microfluidics. This is some ground-based uh, research that um, Alex Blanchard, the PhD uh, graduate student from Florida State, is working on at our lab in uh, Marshall right now. And uh, through some clever experimental work, we're um, trying to mimic what we might find in microgravity, and we can see these uh, sort of spiral structures here. So we'll do some more work with this and then we'll compare it to what we get from the microgravity experiments. Um, next, please. Yeah, the experiments themselves are really conceptually simple. Um, we're going to conduct them on the uh, space station in the glove bag that you see in the um, upper uh, left-hand corner there. And um, this has been successful, and, and this experiment is, is, has a lot of synergy with the uh, microgravity investigation of cement solidification uh, being directed by Professor Alexander Radlinska and graduate student um, Juliana Nevis up at Penn State. And we just completed some of those experiments in that similar glove bag uh, very successfully on the, on the space station. And this is basically what they look like here. We have a, a burst bag here with a weak seal in the center. There's a Teflon insert with a wire on it to which we've attached the crystals. In the bottom is the sodium silicate solution. Um, this will be put into the um, glove bag and it'll be rolled up. The seal will break and the solution will come in contact with the, um, the crystal and we'll see what the growth is when it comes back. Um, next, please. Okay, um, so 
we realize that we want to get a lot of science impact out of this also, but it's important that uh, we have some outreach. And this is a picture of our co-eyes. Um, on the left is uh, Marshall's chief microscopist, uh, Ellen Rabenberg, and on the right is um, a PhD, um, Oliver's a PhD student, Alex uh, Blanchard. And they're doing an outreach program here um, where uh, NASA or Marshall does a NASA in the Park event where they highlight everything that goes on at Marshall. And uh, one of those events was we, we've set up this booth here and, and 160 school age children were introduced to chemistry and making their own chemical gardens. And I'd just like to close by saying um, later on this summer, um, both Alex and Juliana are going to be in Ellen's lab. And I'm expecting some spirited discussions between the relative experiments. And we're really hoping for a solid collaboration between the chemists and the cement scientists. Thank you very much. That's great. That's great. Do we have any uh, questions from our audience? Ken? Wait, hold on. Wait, we got a microphone on you here real quick. Hi, Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. You mentioned the black smokers. Mm -hmm. That could be a potential origin of life. How, talk in a little bit more detail, please, how this work will inform us about the black smokers and origin of so, life. Uh, very important for me is to understand it's not only the material itself, it is the gradient, the pH jump that occurs as you cross this membrane. So the black smokers are often iron sulfides, nickel oxides, materials like that, fairly hot actually, maybe too hot. and uh, so we want to understand and create and study in the laboratory how these materials in the presence of a steep pH or temperature gradient can catalyze certain reactions. And you can do this just more precisely in a controlled systematic way in the lab than you could in a true hydrothermal vent field. I believe. How will the station help you do that? So that aspect is just uh, essentially adding a I would say the microgravity experiments primarily contribute to the understanding of how gravity conditions affect the um, material and the structures that are being formed. But that only indirectly informs this particular aspect of the investigations. And, and we're going to go to Twitter for another question. Sure. Uh, SoCal Ash Ocean guy, Mark, would like to know what would be some practical applications of the chemical gardens oh. here on Earth? So not in the short term. Or, Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, not in the short term, but in the long term. You can think of it as essentially the idea of taking a chemistry lab and shrinking it down to a little tiny microscopic object. If you want to move the chemicals around, you need a little plumbing network for this. <laughs> and we hope that we can grow these plumbing networks in a more intelligent way and elegant way with these structures when we control them. And then particular aspects would have little catalytic features or analytical features. So the one possible application would be to shrink it down. The bigger idea is just to create micro shapes in a very different, uh, not sequential engineering step type of way, but really yeah. through yeah. programming. And these, these structures are, are very uh, sound. You can pour out the liquid and they, stomp, they uh, maintain their shape and you can heat them up and uh, center them. And they have potential uses as, as uh, scaffolding for biological applications and things like that. If we understand how, better, how they grow better, um, we're closer to applying them. Okay, great. In the room, do we have uh, any more questions from our social crowd? Anyone? Okay, Richard, Oliver, thank you for uh, sharing with us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Next up is the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station, known as EcoStress which measures temperatures of plants and uses that information to better understand how much water plants need and how they respond to stress. Joining us today from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory is Dr. Simon Hook, Principal Investigator, and from NASA's Headquarters, Earth Science Division, Program Scientist, Woody Turner. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're gonna tell you a little bit about EcoStress and how EcoStress fits in the overall NASA Earth Science Program. Now, EcoStress stands for the Ecosystem Spaceborne Thermal Radiometer Experiment on Space Station. Yes, I realize it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, it's actually a thermal infrared radiometer that measures the uh, energy that's coming off the surface and then translates that energy into a temperature. So it works a lot like when you put your hand above a stove and you can feel the heat 
uh, and your hand is a crude thermal infrared sensor, obviously this instrument's a lot better than that. And that allows us to get the surface temperature. And once we've got the surface temperature, we can use that to do all sorts of studies. And what we're going to do is look at plants. So if we can just have the first slide. Uh, so plants um, draw in water through their roots, and then that water gets expelled through small pores on the underside of their leaves called stomata. And as this water gets expelled, it keeps the plants cool. And these same pores are used to draw in CO2 and then use it um, uh, to make, uh, with photosynthesis to make sugars and grow the plant. Now, if the plant has enough water, it can stay cool. But if it doesn't, then the stomata close and uh, the plant temperature goes up and eventually it starves. And so we can see this change in plant temperature and we can use it as a proxy for the amount of water that the plant is actually using. Now, um, this uh, process, as I mentioned, is called transpiration from the plant, but there's also evaporation from the surface, and the two combined are called evapotranspiration, and uh, that's what we'll be measuring uh, from the International Space Station. So next slide, please. Uh, so, as you can imagine, uh, evapotranspiration varies throughout the day. And this is actually a plot, and you can see it starts in the morning and then it goes to the end of the evening. And you can see how evapotranspiration increases, and then in the middle of the day it shuts down when the stomata close, and then it starts up again later in the day. So, obviously, what we want to do is be able to see how this varies throughout the day. Now, most satellites fly over at the sort of same time every morning at about 10.30. So they don't really give us a good indication of how this evapotranspiration is varying throughout the day. But the International Space Station is in what's called a precessing orbit, and as a result, it flies over at different times of day. And so we can use the unique vantage point of the International Space Station to be able to see how this is varying uh, through, throughout the day. And there's a picture of a stomata in the background there. So we'll have the next slide, please. Uh, now, the other thing about evapotranspiration is it's what's known as a leading indicator. So what that means is we know what's going on before it actually uh, happens. So we can see the plants are stressed by looking at their temperature before yeah. they um, actually start to turn brown and die. So this is very useful. Now, this is a picture of evapotranspiration rates for the US during one of the major droughts. And you can see the area that was being uh, strongly affected by the drought. Uh, you know, in this uh, image, it's the, uh, the red area. So what we'll be able to do is measure evapotranspiration um, over the entire globe. Now, obviously, a farmer could go out and do this and measure the evapotranspiration themselves, but you need a lot of farmers to be able to cover uh, the entire globe. And so obviously, that's another big advantage uh, with the space station. So I'll have the next slide, please. Uh, and this just illustrates that point I was making earlier about the fact that the uh, International Space Station flies over at different times. Uh, and what you see is, if you look at, say, 10 o'clock, there's a bar chart and it shows that the number's about 24. And we have satellites that fly over, but they, say, fly over twice a month, and they only fly over at uh, 10 o'clock. But with, on the ISS, we'll fly over 24 times at 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, at 12 o'clock, and so on throughout the day, and we can use that. Now, another big advantage with EcoStress is it uh, has a very wide swath. Uh, and the way that that works is um, it has a mirror, and it looks off to one side, and then that mirror scans across the surface as the station is moving forward. And we use that scanning to build up a picture and then turn that into a temperature. So if we go to the next slide, please. So this just next slide just shows you where EcoStress will go on the International Space Station. You can probably see it's uh, indicated by the arrow. It's on the uh, leftmost uh, side of the picture as I'm looking at it. And so what happens is inside that box, there's this mirror that's rotating around. It's looking and it's scanning across as the station is moving forward and we're uh, actually building up the, the image. So what I'd like to do now is just sort of show you a uh, video of that in motion and we'll go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what you can see is the station moving along. At the very front on the uh, left-hand side in the grey area is the GEMIF platform or the uh, Japanese External Module Experiment uh, Facility. And that is where EcoStress is going to go. You can sort of see it's highlighted there on the uh, left. 
And so what will happen is this video will zoom in and we're actually looking at uh, salt and sea. And you can see the green fields. This is what you'd see if you're looking with your eye. But EcoStress will see the temperature. And you can see the different areas, the blue, colder areas. And those are the areas that are being watered or being irrigated. So we can use this information to help farmers to understand what is going on uh, in terms of their crops and to get the maximum yield from the amount of uh, uh, water that is available but we can also use it to look at other regions around the world that are stressed and see how those regions are changing so we can look at the major biomes and we can see whether they're transit whether uh, plants are different plants are coming in or they're transitioning uh, to uh, uh, different types uh, of environments so uh, it's going to be a very useful instrument from that point of view and now i'd like to just hand it over to woody and he'll tell us a little bit more about how it fits in the overall nasa program woody Thank you very much, Simon. This is just a fantastic mission uh, we have here. First, I want to step back and talk a bit about why we care so much about plants. If I could get the first, uh, next slide, I should say, please. Simon mentioned the process of photosynthesis. In that process, plants take energy from our star, the sun, add water and carbon dioxide and produce sugars. Now, these sugars are really key. This plant primary production, these sugars are the basis for the vast majority of food on this planet. In addition, they produce oxygen. So plants are both feeding us and giving and oxygenating, oxygenating our atmosphere so that we can breathe. Major stuff, thanks to plants. Next slide, please. This slide shows the active Earth science space missions uh, of NASA. And it gives you the perspective that we're looking at our planet as we look at other planets in the solar system from the vantage point of space. It's a very holistic, top-down view. And let's just get a, an understanding of the whole Earth system in doing that. Now, the Earth system is quite complex, so we have a number of, a number of systems looking at different components of the Earth system at the same time to try to give us the big picture and understand it sort of soup to nuts, the atmosphere, the ocean, the lands, and life, and how they all interact. Now, We've marked on this particular slide those missions that are focused on the water cycle with a water droplet, those focusing on carbon with a sea. And I want to focus on the water cycle and carbon cycle as well as climate because these are three key elements of our Earth system. And they're, an eco-stress sits right at the intersection of those, those three elements, the carbon cycle, water cycle, and climate. Of course, we, water and carbon are key to all life. And climate is a huge driver of the physical, chemical, and biological elements of our system. as a essentially a prime mover for what's going on on this, on this planet. And EcoStress captures how those three interact, essentially the dance of those three key elements. Um, it's a great integrator and, and, and fantastic. Now, I will have you notice that on the water side of the equation, Many of those, those, uh, those current missions are focusing on the supply side of the water cycle. In other words, where the water comes from, precipitation, uh, where, it's, where, where it's located on the surface, either at the surface or in the soil or perhaps even deep underground. EcoStress, its thermal channels are looking at the demand for water by plants. So we're capturing the demand side there too, another key component of EcoStress. Next slide, please. And the point of this slide is to say that in addition to doing great science, EcoStress is also an applications mission, even though it's only going to be there for a year to year, year or two years, relatively short time. Uh, at, during that time, it will help folks making real-time decisions in, in several areas. One, agriculture. Farmers need to know where to apply water and when to use the water most efficiently. Obviously, water managers need to know where to use water Again, the minimal amount of water necessary in a time of increasing water scarcity. And also because it's a temperature sensor, it has temperature channels on it, it will help us understand some major natural hazards such as droughts and also hot spots from fires and volcanoes. And then finally, it's going to give us the big picture for all natural resource managers, terrestrial natural resource managers, as to how, the, how their systems are doing, how their ecosystems are doing. Are they stressed or not? And for that, of course, it all starts and ends with the plants. Thanks. So does everybody have any questions for Simon or Woody? Please. Uh, Jim Siegel, Space Flight Insider. I'm particularly intrigued by 
uh, how this can be applied to, say, the average farmer down on Earth. So my understanding was that um, y you have echo stress up in the uh, ISS, and it can look down and look for hot spots, and I presume that will um, tell farmers whether to increase or decrease the amount of water that they're giving their plants. I mean, is that true first? So, and then, so and yes, uh, it, it's, it's, it's true. Basically, what will happen is that uh, we have partners on the mission from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and those partners will get the data and work with the data that we make publicly available to everyone. And then they will use that to produce products which the farmers can then use to look at uh, how uh, much evapotranspiration is taking place within their fields. One of the th great things about EcoStress is it allows us to take very detailed pictures. Uh, and so, you know, we can see uh, variations in temperature within a field. And so we can see, uh, the people can see how much water to put on the different parts. Is, is that kind of a real-time thing? I mean, I can call it, up somebody and say, how yeah, are we doing it, today? It's, and it's not a real-time <coughs> thing uh, at the moment. It's an experimental mission that we're trying out for uh, one year. Um, but what we hope to do is, in a few months, get the products out so people can start using them. And then we should be able to update them more frequently, say weekly. Because from a farmer's point of view, you want to know how this is changing over a relatively short period, but it's not in the matter of hours, it's more in the matter of days. Right. And then longer term, after echo stress is decommissioned or whatever on the, on the International Space Station, then what happens? Does another piece of equipment go up there? Or? Well, we'd, we'd certainly like that. But, uh, you know, NASA has to decide uh, what the next missions are going to be. And what we hope that is that EcoStress will just show you how valuable a measurement this is and that they will continue to make those measurements in the future. Okay. Thank you. There's something called, the National Academy puts out something called a decadal survey, which recommends to NASA what types of missions they should be flying. And we just had one come out at the beginning of this year from the National Academy, and one of the, one of the missions they're interested in looking at is a multispectral or hyperspectral, perhaps, thermal instrument. And so stay tuned. Uh, there may well be an eco-stress follow-on on orbit. Thank you. Yes, a question back here, please. Danielle Spinola, Tupelo Honey Teas. Um, I'm, I'm, my question is actually um, on the flip side of uh, that, what you're uh, looking at, and just wondering if you look at the other side of things where, um, you know, where I'm from right now, there's a lot of landslides from too much water. Um, and so is there a look at the stress of maybe too much water on plants in this uh, mission as well? So um, we're not doing that in this mission. But the important thing is that when you measure the surface temperature, just like when you go to the doctors and he takes your temperature, it's indicative of all sorts of uh, ailments and information. Uh, if you look at the surface temperature, you can see other patterns. So you may be able to see some patterns that are associated with uh, changes so that might indicate a landslide or something like that. So these kinds of data have been used in the past to, uh, to look at landslides. Uh, because, you know, with a temperature measurement, you can use it to look at a landslide, you can look at a volcano, say the volcanoes in Hawaii, you know, you can use it to look at heat waves in cities. So it's a very versatile measurement, so you can uh, use it for those kinds of things. But we're not intending to do it with eco-stress, which is focused just on the plants. Very good. We have a question in the back room. Simon. Hi, thanks. I'm Tom Cross with Tesserati. I had a question about the thermal camera. Could you tell us the make and model of the thermal camera? And also, how do you ignore the weather, the temperature of the clouds and rain storms? And is this a, a subscription service that you plan on providing to farmers so that they don't fly drones around equipped with a flare camera on their own fields? Uh, so so that's, I think that was three questions. So I'll do my best to get through them. Uh, so uh, the first one in terms of the instrument, uh, the instrument was uh, designed, developed, built by JPL, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is one of the NASA centers. So it's a, it's a unique, custom, one-of-a-kind instrument. That's the first thing. Um, now, uh, what were the, the second two questions? Sorry. Um, subscription service. Uh, the subscription service question. So uh, NASA makes all its data freely available. And so anyone can go and download uh, the data from EcoStress. Um, uh, you know, once we've done the initial processing. So, um, you, you know, anyone can get access to the data, and that's always been a, a NASA policy and a very important policy for research. And then the storms? How uh, yes, we don't see uh, uh, through clouds, so we rely on the weather being clear. 
Uh, and of course that's important because what that tells you is that you want something that goes over fairly frequently so you can see between the clouds or, or when there aren't clouds uh, there. And so one of the advantages of this instrument is because it has such a wide swath, we get to see every few days. The other instruments don't go over until every two weeks. So if they, if they hit a cloudy, cloudy day, then they don't get to go over for a whole month. Whereas because we go over fairly frequently, we can uh, get opportunities to see when it's not cloudy. Thank okay, you. we have time for just one more question right here. Um, and, and, and you mentioned that field of view. What, what is that field of view in, in miles or kilometers on the ground that it can see? So it's uh, uh, 400 kilometers uh, on the ground. So it is really a wide field of view. It's plus or minus 25 degrees. Uh, there's a lot of information on, at ecostress.jpl.nasa.gov about the instruments and the characteristics, um, but it is a very uh, wide, field, wide field of view. And so, uh, you know, that's what allows us to look so frequently. Well, let's thank Simon and Woody for sharing with us the EcoStress program. Thank you. <laughs> Next, the BCATS CS investigation will study forces between particles that cluster together in sediment. Please welcome Dr. Paolo Luzzazzo Fidgets, the principal investigator from the University of California, Santa Barbara and the director of the National Science Foundation Division of Chemical, Bioengineering, Environmental, and Transport Systems, Richard Dickinson. Thank you, Greg. Uh, yeah, my name is Rich Dickinson. I'm the director of CBET, which is the, the long-winded uh, di uh, division that was just mentioned. That's in the engineering directorate at the National Science Foundation. So I'm very excited today to uh, talk about our very uh, first uh, launch in the engineering Directorate, which is Paula's experiment. So I got a, a very short prepared statement, and then uh, Paula will, it's really his show today, he'll give his, uh, his talk, and then I'll be happy to take uh, questions afterwards. Uh, the NSF is a federal agency that invests in fundamental research and education across science and engineering. For nearly seven decades, NSF has shaped the, the nation's scientific enterprise by funding innovative research at universities and colleges and at research facilities around the world. Tomorrow, we're launching our very first engineering experiment to be performed in the microgravity environment at the International Space Station National Lab, thanks to our partnership with CASIS. Um, our collaboration with CASIS focuses on research problems in fluid dynamics, combustion, and tissue engineering. And this will advance scientific understanding and lead to future benefits to life on Earth. So now I'm very pleased to introduce Paulo. Uh, he's the first investigator that's uh, setting an experiment up. Uh, he's an assistant professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, Professor Lugato um, Fidgets uh, investigates theoretical, experimental, and computational fluid dynamics with the eye towards energy production and conservation. NSF is pleased to fund as a new project, his group's new project, I should say, uh, on the launch tomorrow that examines fundamental dynamics of sediments, which has implications for lakes, rivers, and oceans around the world. So thank you. Thank you. So what we're going to do is we're going to send some sediment to the International Sp Station. And what we're interested in is looking at what we call uh, cohesive forces in sediment. Now, sediment is made up of clay as well as silt and sand. And by cohesive forces, we really mean what makes a sediment essentially sticky. If you imagine taking a handful of mud, it has some stickiness to it. Uh, now, these cohesive forces are very important to how sediment gets transported in the environment and in engineering systems. However, they're very weak if you compare them to the force of gravity. And that means that it can be very hard to study them accurately here on Earth. Uh, now, if we can look at the first uh, slide, please. So this is a picture uh, taken with a scanning electron microscope of clay. And clay is essentially what gives you the smallest particles in sediment. They are a thousandth of a millimeter or less across. And they're so small that if they get close enough to each other, they can essentially stick to each other through what are essentially uh, uh, electrical kind of uh, forces. Now, these forces are what we call cohesive forces. And they depend in some very complicated ways on what kind of minerals you have in there, whether you have any salt, in there and whether you have maybe any uh, man-made contaminants. Now, if we look at the next slide, please. So for example, if you put clay 
in salt water, this is something you can see, you can get these uh, aggregates, which are order of uh, 10 micron across. And in turn, these can come together and make even larger aggregates. And these have a, a huge impact on how sediment is transported uh, in the environment. So for example, you can think of a river that carries sediment into the ocean. Uh, the sediment particles will typically come together and make aggregates. Uh, these aggregates will then sink uh, more than 100 times faster than the original uh, primary particles would have. Now, if the uh, particles do not aggregate, uh, then they will settle much more slowly in the water column, which, for example, will mean that light will have a very hard time uh, entering the water column. And so you'll then have that uh, algae, for example, will have a hard time growing, and that can undercut the food supply in your ecosystem. So then you can ask, well, how do I make uh, an experiment involving cohesive uh, sediment? Uh, well, you uh, ideally would like to put some uh, sediment in a small container and then stir it until you break up uh, these aggregates. And then you like to look as these aggregates uh, form again. And then from this aggregation motion, you can deduce back what the forces are. Now, that's fine in the ocean where you have uh, hundreds of feet where the sediment can fall as it aggregates. However, in the lab, your sediment will quickly reach the bottom of your uh, container. And so you can only look at aggregation over very short time scales in the lab. So that's why we're going to do an experiment on the space station, because we can essentially turn off the effects of gravity. Uh, could we have the next slide, please? So. Uh, we're sending an array of 10 small containers that have different kinds of minerals in them. That's the uh, sort of black plate you see there in the middle with 10 little containers. Uh, on the left, you have a flash, which will shine a light through the uh, containers. And then any aggregates will essentially show up as dark or darker spots in the images that are taken by a camera there on the right. And here, we are fortunate that we get to essentially use again a previous uh, setup uh, called the BCAT, which had been used for other kinds of colloids, uh, predominantly man-made, engineered colloids. But here we're going to send a natural uh, colloid to the uh, space station. And I mentioned uh, the application involving uh, river flows and estuaries, but there are many other applications. For example, uh, whether sediment behaves cohesively is very important to the transport of any contaminants or pollutants that stick to the sediment. Uh, they're also very important to the process that give rise to uh, ultimately hydrocarbon reservoirs. Um, and so that can help us, uh, for example, more efficiently uh, map such reservoirs. Now, if I can have the final slide, please. So to then uh, deduce models from the ISIS experiments, which we can use uh, for the benefit of life on Earth, uh, what we're going to do is, with my colleague Eckhart Mayberg and his group uh, also at UC Santa Barbara, uh, we're going to run supercomputer simulations of uh, these uh, cohesive sediment. Here you, you have uh, sediment settling under the effect of gravity with different degrees of uh, uh, strength for the cohesive forces. Uh, of course, we can also turn off gravity and then mirror what we're going to get on the space station. And by comparing the simulations to the um, ISS experiments, we can then deduce models for how sediment gets transported, which then we can use for the benefit of uh, life on Earth. So, thank you. So do we have any questions for Paulo? Sir. Uh, Jim Siegel with uh, Spaceflight Insider. Could you back up a little bit and maybe talk bigger picture about why this is important to life here on Earth. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar myself with the, the importance of sediment or how it, how it affects life or plant growth or whatever. So what, what's the problem that this is trying to solve and how is this going to help solve it? Uh, so for example, one way that hydrocarbon deposits can form is uh, by having uh, this particular kind of uh, what are essentially underwater avalanches of sediment. 
uh, form. These are called turbidity currents. And uh, once they form a deposit, uh, over time that can lead to a hydrocarbon reservoir. Uh, now the uh, process of understanding the geology of something like that has a lot to do with essentially understanding the history of the fluid mechanics that led to the formation of this of the structure that then we see today. And then we can, um, through these uh, uh, models, we can, for example, develop criteria for the initiation of these underwater avalanches and then how they will actually propagate and, and what uh, structure the deposit will ultimately have. And so, for example, um, in practice, that could mean that you'd be able to much more quickly infer what the uh, morphology of the deposit is, so you'd have to drill fewer exploratory wells. Uh, when you drill a well, it can be the, of the cost of the order of tens of millions of dollars or, or more. Um, and uh, drilling fewer wells is saving money and also saving uh, environmental uh, risk, mitigating environmental risk. Does anybody else have a question for Paolo or Richard? Back here, please. Would a potential future application of your results be to actually introduce uh, something to cause an aggregate in a water supply where the sunlight was not creating algae? Yes, that's a very good. That's a very good example. You um, already use, for example, for water treatment. So this is an engineering application. There are uh, agents that are added called flocculants to help uh, uh, undesirable substances settle quickly. Uh, this would essentially give us uh, uh, a general treatment of how these kind of agents could work in an environmental setting. Yes, that, that's a very nice question. Hi, uh, John Taylor with Geekify. Um, can you tell us more about the samples that you selected? Why the sizes, the sediment types, a little bit more about the materials themselves? So that was a big part of our um, experiments that we ran here on Earth before uh, sending uh, uh, the samples up. As I mentioned here, the setup, we we're lucky enough to be able to use again one that was already in place. So that was the main challenge to choose what, uh, what samples to send. Um, this essentially what we found was the area that was likely to give us the strongest payoff um, in terms of the science. Um, there are many different things we want to investigate, the effects of the minerals, the effects of the salt. Uh, we were fortunate that we seem to have made quite a lot of progress on the effect of the salinity, for example, already on Earth. And so we're going to primarily focus on the effect of the uh, different minerals for, for this mission. Okay, well, let's uh, thank Paolo and Richard for sharing a little bit about their project. And sometimes referred to as the new hand, our final speaker today comes to us from the Canadian Space Agency and will share with us the updates to the new latching and effector on Canada Arm 2, the Canadian robot arm aboard the ISS. Please welcome Ked Pawalski, Canadian ISS Program Manager. Thanks, Rick. So I'm here to talk to you about actually a number of Canadian interests that we have in this mission. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about science. I'll talk about our next crew flight that we're going to have, a Canadian crew member. I'll talk a little bit about the operations, the space, uh, the robotics operations that will be required to support SpaceX 15. And then I'll finish up with talking about the latching end effector. So on the science side of things, uh, Canadian science is highly focused on human, sp uh, human health sciences and at cr on crew performance. Uh, so we have a number of experiments that are going on on the station. Those go over on a long term. Um, multiple crew members, multiple samples. One of the things that we like about uh, the SpaceX vehicle is it has the ability to return stuff back to the ground. So coming back on SpaceX 15, we're going to have some of the blood and plasma samples that are coming back from those experiments. So that's going to be very valuable to us in supporting our science. And, you know, our focus on uh, human health sciences is basically very portable to our applications on Earth. We like to look at things like va uh, aging, like vascular disease, those kind of things that affect our society. Uh, we also look at it from a crew performance point of view because when we go to Mars, and you'll note that I said when, not if, uh, when we go to Mars, we want to be able to optimize crew performance and be able to have crew on board that are going to be able to best do those missions. So that's the science side of things. From a crew point of view, 
uh, coming up in December. Uh, we'll be launching on Expedition 5859, David Saint-Jacques. So that is going to be our third uh, long-duration spaceflight opportunity for Canada. Uh, so that's going to be a pretty big deal for us. Uh, one of the things that connects his mission to SpaceX 15 is he's actually going to be launching some of his requested food items are going to be going up on SpaceX 15. So we actually got, I think on, on the CSA Twitter account last night, we got a question about whether maple syrup was flying up. Uh, so I don't think it's actually flying up on this flight. It might be flying up on a subsequent flight. Um, however, there is some maple smoked salmon, crab, lobster. Uh, so I don't think David is a big uh, red meat guy. I think he likes his fish. So that's going up on SpaceX 15. So we're looking forward to, uh, to that mission coming. That's going to be a big deal for us. Uh, next, I wanted to talk about some of the robotics operations. So SpaceX 15 is going to be a vehicle that flies up the station. It doesn't actually dock to the space station. Uh, so what we do is we do a free flyer capture using the Canadarm2. Uh, using Canadarm2, uh, this is actually going to be our 30th vehicle that we capture. Uh, and basically the, the Dragon capsule will fly up close to station, get to about 10 meters, about 30 feet. Uh, and then with a crew member on board, we'll actually reach out with Canadarm2, grapple the vehicle while flying at you know 25,000 kilometers per hour, and then secure the vehicle, and then we'll maneuver that vehicle in, berth it to the station, and then we can start the process of unloading it. So that's one important part of it, but also we then continue the operations with our other robotic system, which is Dexter, the two-armed robot that we do maintenance on the space station with. Uh, and then we actually go in and unload the payloads that are in the trunk of the vehicle, and then we bring those onto, onto station, move them around different parts of station, shuffle all those payloads around, and then at the end of the day, we have to bring, at the end of the mission, we have to bring payloads that are now going to be demanifested from the station and going to be returned for destructive reentry into that trunk and basically reload the trunk so they can go back uh, into the atmosphere. So that's the operations side of things. So space, ro space robotics there plays a pretty critical role in terms of supporting these missions. Um, we're also going to, when we release that vehicle, I think this time around we're going to do our planned, this is going to be our third planned uh, ground control release of a vehicle. Uh, so this is a relatively new thing for us. Uh, we tried that back on SpaceX 13, went very well, made that nominal for SpaceX 14, and now subsequent SpaceX flights. We'll be looking at the other vehicles that we capture as well to do that. Uh, it's just a point about how we continue to push forward and evolve and continue to look at how we do robotics operations and how we can do things more efficiently. And as we do that, we're actually freeing up crew time, and then that crew time is then applied to science. So the last thing I wanted to mention was our latching end effector. So, uh, you know, certainly not last, but certainly not least. Uh, the latching end effector is really, the, or the Lee, is the business end of the Canadarm2. So on the Canadarm2, we actually have one of these latching end effectors on each end of the arm. Now, that allows us to grapple payloads. It allows us to capture vehicles. Um, it also allows us to connect the different attachment points on the station and it allows us to make a structural power data and video connection there so we th that we can then effectively use the other end of the arm as the base. That allows the arm to be able to walk around the station. So clearly a latching end effector is very important to us. And because they're so important, so critical to how we use the system, and because we're so mobile in what we need to do with our system, we've put a lot of wear and tear on that system. Now, we've had a very good run with the Canada Arm 2 in terms of nearly 17 years of operations without any real major issues. However, we did get to that point where it's like when you, you know, if you, if you meet a, a tradesperson and you, and you shake their hands, you kind of realize that their hands kind of go through a lot of hardship. Uh, so after about 17 years of operations, we were starting to notice that we were having a little bit of a trouble with our hands, getting a little bit arthritic, if you will. Uh, so we had planned to start changing out one of the latching end effectors on the Canadarm2. And actually back last fall in 2017, uh, we happened to have a failure on the other one. So luckily, we have spares available on orbit. Did two spacewalks back in October, changed out one of the latching end effectors on the Canadarm2, and then in February, we actually made the decision to change the other one. So the good news with that is that Canadarm2 has two perfectly functional latching end effectors. Everything's working very well there. That went exceptionally well for us. Now the trick is, is we want to launch this new latching end effector and put that on station to have an available spare. Because we do the assembly, the maintenance operations, because we do the resupply of the station with the space robotics, and it's a, it's a critical system, we always want to be able to protect for a failure. So if we get anything, any kind of random failure or any kind of issue that pops up, we want to have that available spare on orbit and, and, and ready for us to swap that in if we need it. And I guess the last point I'll make 
is SpaceX 15 is also going to be critical for us. And remember I said that we like SpaceX, or we like the Dragon vehicles because we can get stuff back up, down on the ground. Well, the failed latching end effector that we changed out back in October, we actually brought that inside the space station and we we're going to be able to squeeze that into the, into the Dragon capsule and then return that to Earth. We'll get that back, back down on the ground. We'll fly that back up to Ontario, Canada. Uh, our prime contractor will put it in their, comp their capable hand hands, McDonald, Detweiler and Associates. They're going to refurbish that latching end effector. And then basically with that, we'll have an available a subsequent available spare that we can use. And that allows us to plan for going to 2024 and hopefully beyond that. And that's about what I had, Greg. Great. Does anybody have any questions for Ken? Right here, please. Uh, when, when you talked about the ground control release that started on CRS-13, was there anything on the ARM side, any software or anything from the ARM perspective that had to change, or was that all station ground communication side? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, so, I mean, in general, we have actually re-architected the entire mobile servicing system, so all of our robotic suite that's on the station. We've probably changed just about everything about it in terms of how we operate and the, co and the code that we use to do that. Uh, one of the big changes that we did was to implement ground control. The original design of the system, the original concept, it was all going to be crew operated. Um, once we got into doing that and we saw what the potentials were, we actually changed the software and how we use the system and then started to implement ground control. With that, we had to put in all the different safety protocols, so it's a combination of changes to the software, changes to how we actually do the commanding from the ground, and then, of course, the communications infrastructure and how we do that to be able to put that together. So it's, it's really a combination of all those pieces that will allow us to be able to do things like a, a release, a ground control release. Anybody else? I think I forgot to call up my graphics. So I think I have one slide up there with the latching end effector. Sure, we can bring that up. We can bring that up while we're looking for questions. Some of those graphics did come up while you were speaking. Oh, good. I'm glad people were thinking yeah. about that more than I was. <laughs> <laughs> I took a picture of them. So. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. There you go. Excellent. Uh, so you mentioned some of the food that's going up on this mission for, for the astronaut in December. Um, I'm kind of curious about the, the form that some of, uh, some of that food takes. Is it freeze-dried or is it in a pouch that's warmed up? or how, 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 What's the form of, of some of that? Food? I think you pretty much hit the answer there. It's usually dehydrated, uh, sometimes freeze-dried, uh, almost always contains, individually contained and packaged. Uh, they portion it out in a couple different ways, so sometimes it's resealable. Usually, I think it's one-off uh, one portions. Thank you. Okay, we have time for just one more question. Go back question. Go ahead. So you mentioned robotics and focused a lot on Canada Arm 2, but I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, how's Dexter doing? Dexter's actually doing quite well. Uh, we launched Dexter in 2008, so we, we, don't have, we don't yet have the same concerns about its latching end effector. Um, you know, one thing I mentioned, you know, I, I said we've got a latching end effector on, e on either end of the Canada Arm 2. We've also got a latching end effector on our mobile base system that travels up and down the main truss of the space station, and we've got a latching end effector on Dexter. Uh, so Dexter's latching end effector is doing quite well. We do expect that, you know, as we use that system quite a bit as well, uh, we'll get to the point where we'll have enough cycles on it that we'll start to really kind of closely follow the performance there and look at how things are performance from a performing from a friction point of view and such, which are kind of the indicators that we were following with the Canada Arm 2 uh, leads. Um, other than that, uh, we've had some minor issues with the hands on Dexter. Dexter uses smaller hands because it <coughs> does much more precise and dexterous work in terms of operating with the avionics and computer boxes and batteries and such on the outside of the space station. Uh, but it's, it's actually doing very, very well. Uh, overall, I, I would dare say that we've got an exceptional performance out of our space robotics just because 17 years into the game for a system that was designed for you know a 10-year operational life, 15 years on orbit, and with the, issue, the, the very few issues that we've had, I think our biggest problems is really about cameras. We've changed a number of cameras. We've got new cameras in the works, and those are actually very nice because we can actually change them out robotically. So that's a case where you're using our own robots to fix our own robots. So it works actually... It's, it's kind of the ideal scenario. Well, thank you, Ken, for sharing with us today. And thank we you. really appreciate it.
So this concludes our What's On Board briefing. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for being here and also for all our presenters who uh, shared with you their uh, impact on our mission. Um, if you'd like to follow the launch activities, please go to www.nasa.gov backslash SpaceX for all launch activities. And coming up next at 12.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on NASA TV, we'll be having our pre-launch news conference for the SpaceX CRS-15 launch. Thank you again for joining us.